Welcome to the committee. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, for having Anoka County come and talk about our fraud prevention <coughs> investigation program. You have to tell us your name, though, because we just, yeah. even though I said it, so okay. you please. <laughs> yeah, so my name is um, Cindy Caesar, and I'm the Human Service Division Manager in Anoka County. And I'm going to have um, our staff introduce themselves before we um, start testifying. I'm Chris Plombon, and I supervise, I'm a supervisor in economic assistance and supervise this area. Jody Gorman, the Fraud Prevention Coordinator. Lorraine Gabbert, Investigations Manager for the Anoka County Attorney's Office. Perfect. Ms. Caesar, go ahead. Thank you. Um, Anoka County, we have operated a fraud prevention investigation program since about 1993. So we have a very long history um, and have had some really good successes. We also um, have a strong commitment in our county on prevention and identification of fraud. Funding for the program comes from the OIG's office. However, the funding um, also has come from the county, about half of that, um, so that we can make sure that we have a fully operational team. Our team includes a fraud prevention coordinator, county attorneys, two investigators um, that we also contract with the sheriff's office. We believe that the fraud prevention program has some very important benefits overall. One, it increases public and worker confidence in the integrity of public assistance programs. We also are able to gather information and use um, that information um, to set policy and rule changes. It increases client compliance with reporting requirements and it also guarantees benefit savings for federal, state, and the county dollars. We also um, have had some just really amazing results. So in 2017, we did investigate 624 cases, um, which were completed by our, um, our staff, which included overpayments and a savings of about $1.9 billion. And within those cases, about 70% of those were substantiated. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you said billion. You meant million, right? What did you say? Did people yeah. hear billion? Oh. Million, yes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> fraud prevention programs are required to have a cost-benefit ratio above $3. And Anoka County had a ratio of $5.98 for 2017 compared to the statewide average of $4.42. We are also required to have below 15 days for every investigation, and within our program, we averaged 11 days per investigation. Now I'm going to have Chris Plomblom, the Supervisor of Economic Assistance, talk a little bit more about the program. Mr. Chair and members of the committee, our FPI team investigates suspected client fraud in public assistance programs, including SNAP, cash, medical, and child care assistance. The investigation usually begins with a referral from a financial worker who is responsible for determining eligibility for public assistance programs. The program was developed to prevent fraud at the initial application. However, investigations can also be done on cases currently open when there is discrepant information. The majority of our fraud investigations are completed by our FPI unit, but we do refer cases to the county attorney's office when additional investigation is needed due to time constraints and or the egregiousness of the fraud. Anoka County's FPI program operates in collaboration with the sheriff's office, the county attorney's office, central county, county auditor, and economic assistance, including child support and child care assistance. Our fraud prevention coordinator, Ms. Gorman, will discuss a couple examples of fraud cases that involved our FPI unit and the county attorney's office. So, Mr. Chair and members of the committee, um, uh, the couple of the examples that I'm going to go over are cases that, um, that we had in our county, but we were unable to prosecute due to some current issues with statutes. Um, the first example was a, a married couple that applied for public assistance um, he, they owned and operated several businesses. When they applied for public assistance, they claimed $1,000 a month in income and $810 a month in expenses. Their home was purchased for $379,000 with a $20,000 down payment and a mortgage payment of $2,500 per month, which was current. 
taxes were $6,000 a year and were also current. Vehicles that were purchased, um, the first vehicle was purchased for $48,000, which was current on payments. The second vehicle was purchased for $54,000, they were current on payments. And the third vehicle was purchased for $33,000 and was current on payments. All the vehicles had personalized license plates. Revolving credit showed the payments of $1,120 a month and installment credit of $4,900 per month and both um, were current. Credit applications showed that the husband's income, and this was a credit application that was pulled on a vehicle purchase where he reported his income to be $105,000 per year and the wife's income was $45,000 per year. But again, they had only reported $1,000 per month to the worker. All personal expenses were being paid through business accounts and only minimum income was being paid to the client from the businesses. They were only, um, because of current policy, we were only able to utilize the income that the family reported, which was actually paid to them when in fact the family received significant payments from the business. The total overpayments that resulted that we were unable to charge was $180,000. The second example was clients um, that were also self-employed and owned several businesses. The clients had substantial deposits going into both personal and business bank accounts of unknown origin. Um, there was a deposit in particular for $110,000 that the clients stated were from family members in their country that was loaned to them for the purchase of their home. Their house was valued at $372,000. The case was dismissed in court because we could not prove that the source of the deposits were income from the business. We couldn't prove whether they were income or loans. Um, I will turn it over now to Lorraine Gabbert from the county attorney's office. Thank you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, I'm Lorraine Gabbert. I'm the investigations manager for the Anoka County Attorney's Office. My focus will be on the area of criminal prosecution of public assistance fraud. The Anoka County Attorney's Office has a long history of aggressively investigating and prosecuting public assistance fraud. That work continues as part of a cooperative effort with the Anoka County Department of Human Services and its Fraud Prevention Investigation Unit. Our investigative unit consists of the investigations manager and two investigators, and we investigate and refer for prosecutions case that, cases that rise to the level of a more serious uh, felony case, uh, excuse me, generally over $10,000 in public assistance benefits. These cases must be, be able to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, and as is necessary in a criminal prosecution. Most cases are handled through the Human Services Administrative Disqualification Hearing process, and although our office accepts fewer cases for criminal prosecution than we have historically, the dollar amounts have increased um, decidedly in the past. One case from 2016, which resulted in a conviction, involved near, nearly $225,000 in overpayments. Another conviction from 2017 resulted in $102,000 in restitution. Ms. Gorman spoke about criminal prosecutions with overpayments of $180,000 and $63,000 that were ultimately dismissed. They were dismissed because the prosecutor, prosecutor could not, with current statutes, prove the household mainly cash income was not from an excluded source such as gifts or loans. Again, the burden of proof is on the prosecution. Also under current personal, uh, current statute, <clears throat> personal expenditure, expenditures that come from a business bank account are not attributed to the household as income. This tied the hands of the prosecutor in at least one of those cases and um, Anoka County in the 2018 legislative session addressed, uh, supported legislation that would have addressed that and made that income attributable to the household. Uh, it is anticipated that Anoka County will again pursue that change in statute in the next legislative session. Um, other factors that hamper successful prosecution are public as assistance application forms that are vague or nonspecific. Um, as in the case of medical assistance fraud, non-existent because the applications are done online. Proof of intent to commit fraud is a key element that must be proved, and current policy hinders that effect. Effort, excuse me. Um, we just have a few recommendations that 
I think overall would assist us in preventing fraud. Um, we would suggest clarification and changes to laws for public assistance and child care assistance in determining income and assets. As an example, we just received a bulletin that assets for receiving child care assistance is now at a million dollars. Our team discussed a couple examples of cases that highlight the way our laws create a loophole for fraud, specifically in the area of self-employment. Our recommendation is that income should include funds transferred into a business account from a personal account or funds paid directly from a business account that are used to pay personal expenses such as rent, mortgage, auto, utilities, food, and other expenses should not be direct, directly related to that business. And last, um, as I mentioned before, Anoka County um, put in quite a significant amount of money to make this team really functional. And so we would um, advocate for increased funding so counties can adequately fund their fraud prevention programs. Um, again, I just want to thank you again for asking Anoka County to come and talk with you about our program today. And we are open for any questions that you may have. Uh, go ahead, Senator Isaac. Thank you. Uh, first, I appreciate uh, making sure that we are uh, spending our money appropriately and finding uh, where there is fraud, trying to fix and, and reclaim that money back and prosecute and maybe deter people in the future. So I think that's uh, vitally important. To give me a sense of context, I'd be interested in knowing, um, you guys threw some numbers out there, I'm just interested in knowing what were the amounts that you said uh, just in those cases alone or maybe in a general, like in a year, that we're seeing fraud occurring in Anoka County? Do you have that by any chance? And um, whichever, Ms. Caesar, you wanted, or whoever else. Cindy, do you have it? Um, basically, I think, Jody, I think you have those numbers, correct? Basically, just like what could, what, what, the word anticipate is never good because we want to anticipate zero, right? But if we had to guess what, what level or how much fraud was occurring, do you have like a dollar amount on it, like a year, like 17 or 18, or I guess not 18, but 17 so, or 16? So independent if they could prosecute it, just their thought about how much fraud there is mm -hmm. in general. Yeah, Mr. So, Chair, um, Senator Isaacson, um, basically we collected in um, 2017 $1.9 million. And just in Oka. That's just in Oka County. And we investigated 624 cases. And so overall, 70% of them included some type of fraud. And in Anoka County, um, that comes from a pool of cases mm -hmm. um, of 41,000. So it's about 2% overall that were referred to us for investigation. Sure. Senator Isaacson. And do you have a sense of, um, I mean, 1.9 million is nothing to sneeze at, right? Uh, but what I want to know, um, to, just to get a sense of scale, how much is there, are you spending in Anoka County in general on, on these, just to compare like what percentage is the fraud versus what's going out that's, that we believe might be being spent reasonably or, or well, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Ms. Mr. Yeah, Mr. Chair, um, Senator, overall um, our OIG grant is $245,000. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, the county contributes 237000 for a total of 482. I'm sorry, I was not clear, and that's my fault. But that, I would want to know that. And thank you for bringing that up, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, what I want to know is if you've spent, if, if you think 1.9 million was uh, possibly fraudulent, out of how much did we spend on services in Oka County? So if we gave out X amount of million dollars and 1.9 million of it was fraudulent, what is that X that we took it out of total? in terms of services provided, do we know? Ms. Caesar. I didn't, I'm not sure if she came prepared for the math, but um, she's- I, I imagine not, I, I understand I'm putting like on spot. I'd even be happy with the ballpark figure. Yeah, Senator, Ms. I think Caesar. we will have to get back with you mm -hmm. on the answer to that question, because mm -hmm. we don't have that available right now. Okay, thank you. And Senator Isaacson, so uh, they gave the ratio of their recovery, so they spend $1 and get back $5.98. Mm -hmm. um, and the statewide average is four dollars and forty-two. Cents. Right. So and that's so that I, mean, I don't know the the, the X. Mr. Know, Chair, what I'm asking is how much money do they spend on services? Sure. Like not what they do, but 
in the services they provide that this 1.9 million is coming from. Yeah. That's what I want to know. I they got that. So, so they're going to give you. that back to us. Maybe Mr. Uh, Lombard, can maybe know how much Noka County spends on human services? Uh, Senator Kiffmeyer. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. When you save this money, and thank you for all your good work, uh, when you save this, uh, where do those savings dollars go, the 1.9? Do they go back to the state of Minnesota, or are they divided between the county and the state? What happens to it? Ms. Caesar or whoever. To my knowledge, those funds go back to the state. Um, you know, part of it is we do receive a grant for our activities. Um, and we are held to, you know, of course, outcome measurements, but those dollars go back. Senator Kiffmeyer. Yeah, Mr. Chair, so when you say the dollars go back, they, uh, they go back to the state of Minnesota, to the general fund? Yes, they go back to the state. Okay, so Anoka and the grant are paying the expenses of this work, but the benefit is to the state of Minnesota, from what I am hear you saying. That'd be correct. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Senator Ralph. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> I'm, I'm curious. Now, we've been focusing on criminal prosecution, and obviously the, the standard of proof there is very high. Um, are there any provisions, or would it be useful to have civil collection procedures available that don't necessarily have to meet that high standard of proof, but yet could still be effective in terms of recovering money that was uh, wrongfully paid over, or, or are you doing that? Mr. Uh, Chair whomever. and yeah. Senator um, Ralph, what we do is we do have, um, we can administratively disqualify the client and the amount of overpayment would be the same whether we do it criminally or civilly. Um, with the disqualification, though, they do have, for the first offense, it's a one-year disqualification. The second offense, it's a two-year disqualification from the program that they violated. And the third offense is a permanent disqualification. Senator Ralph. So if I understand correctly, what you're saying is, is your, your remedy basically is to not allow them to remain in the program. But is there a civil remedy to recover monies wrongfully paid? And, and uh, I'm, I'm thinking again of, of the ease, or not the ease, but at least the lower standard of proof involved in a civil remedy, which would be more efficient from the standpoint of your, your, your offices having to, uh, the work you'd have to do. And I'm just wondering if that's something that you're using now or if most of the recovery comes from criminal prosecution and then, and then restitution requirements. Ms. Corman. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator, I would say that um, we are, most of the recovery is through civil um, recoupment. Senator Rell. And actually, um, the human service budget in Oka County is somewhere around 200 million, isn't it? Um, Mr. Chair, I... I, mean, I think it's park, about a, almost $100 million, 100. I think, total, but that would include some of the waiver activities as a part of that All right, well, that's just, that's just a number, so that's, that's 2%. So anyway. Oh, Senator Otke. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, question for Ms. Gorman, and you, as you were describing some of these overpayments that you weren't able to collect because of uh, problems with the statute, and then there was uh, mention of 2018 legislation. Was that le legislation to help in this matter, to be able to collect those and not get thrown out? Or do we, are you looking at something additional that you need to bring forward this year so that you're able to have the tools to make your collections? Ms. Gorman. Um, Mr. Chair and Senator, we, um, whether we charge it criminally or civilly, we still do um, go after the overpayments through <coughs> recoupment process. Um, the legislation would be to tighten up some statute in allowing us to better define what income is on the self-employment cases. Senator Rocky. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And the legislation that you need, was that in 2018 and didn't make it through? Uh, or what you're really needing hasn't been brought forward, forward yet and we need to look at it yeah. in 2019? 
Uh, Mr. Ms. Chair, Caesar. Senator, um, right now Anoka County is going through the process of bringing forward proposals. And um, the pr proposal that we had in 2018, we're going to bring that forward again this year. Okay. Thank Senator. you. Okay. Actually, so I'm just doing the math in my head. So we got 100 on everything. And so most of the work you're doing is on the economic assistance part, which is the cash grants and, and SNAP and housing and that sort of thing. Is that right? Yeah, Senator yes, Ebler, um, primarily what we're focusing on is public assistance and child care assistance. Okay. So it's solely in those two areas. And so, um, all right, so I guess we are really interested in knowing what that number is that you're kind of putting most of your focus on. Uh, none of you have mentioned anything about PCAs or the waiver programs, and so I'm going to get to that in a little bit, but um, do you think that that's half of your budget, the economic assistance spate of yeah, stuff? Senator, in um, human services, there's actually five different departments, and economic assistance is one of those areas. Child um, care assistance is housed within our social service department. Right. But anyway, so let, let's say it's, I mean, if, if it were 50 million of the 100, I'm just totally throwing numbers out, that would be about a 4% um, recovery of fraudulent spending. And there's some you couldn't prove. And so that's, we're just trying to get our arms around, like, how much is there? And that number will at least give us a start. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and, and so it will give us some more vigor on our enthusiasm here. So, Ms. Caesar, you were going to say something. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, the number that I had talked about previously, that was the human services budget. And so we're talking about payments um, and benefits that are being made out of economic assistance. That number we will have to get back to you. Right, right. I got that. To. Um, okay. So we've um, talked about your efforts. And it, it, um, if indeed... The, the OIG's back there, I'm smiling at her. Um, you know, we struggle with finding ways to put a dollar, what's it gonna turn into? And so the OIG gives you $245,000, it turns into 750,000 on their share and you put in an equal number and you get that, you recover a similar amount which all goes back to Minnesota. So at least on a state level, it might be logical to think if we gave you some more money from the a state grant that you might actually begin to recover more of those six to ones. How much do you think, if you had to like, what amount of staff could you reasonably have beyond what you have to do the undone work that you would want to do, do you think? Uh, Mr. Chair, I think if we're just talking about the activities that we're responsible um, for, I think we, in Anoka County, like I had said before, we put in half of the total dollar amount for the staffing that's required. Um, I know at times um, our county attorney's office may struggle because some of these cases um, are extremely difficult to try to investigate and prosecute. And so I'm certain that most likely um, it would be beyond most likely what the county is putting in. But I, so maybe my, my question I think was really unclear. So. There's more work out there. There's more fraud to find. If you had more staff, you would go digging and you would find more. Maybe you found the easiest ones at the six to one rate, but maybe you'd get some three and four to one recoveries. It would be a diminishing return because you would, you know, find. But there's, so I'm interested just going forward here. How big do you wish your staff was if you could have as much? And that's not for now, just uh, ruminating going forward. Um, and so, on a, so we talked about economic assistance. Have you put much energy into child care uh, reviews, and is that part of the 1.9? Can you discuss what you found in child care for fraud? Yeah. Um, Mr. Chair, child care assistance um, is also a part of this team's, um, you know, work. Um, and. I mean, this is the team basically in place, except for the, the sheriff's office that provide those investigations. Outside of public assistance and child care assistance, it's not the county's responsibility to do those investigations. We refer to them if we suspect fraud and that when we, and we um, directly refer to the OIG's office. Okay, uh, so Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, 
I see where you're getting at, and I perhaps will take it a little bit different direction. Um, there has been questionable uh, work on this the CCAP uh, issue that came out, and I've known about the fraud for before that was announced publicly, and I was amazed. I was just flat out amazed at a $100 million fraud price tag. Uh, number one, my question to you is, were you as flabbergasted and amazed at that amount of $100 million fraud in CCAP? Ms. Caesar. Ms. Ms. Caesar. Carmen I don't mean to put you on the spot, but, or, because talking with the counties prior to, to um, this investigation, there, there was uh, obvious fraud that was going on and a level of, of uh, fear that this was going to be, um, there was going to be some news let and no, fully knowing that there was some compromise in the program. Uh, and that's, that really bothers me a lot. So I guess I'd like to spin it, your question, uh, Mr. Chair, to the fact that what can we do to help you to make this program work like it's supposed to work and provide the services to these families that need it without uh, us going forward knowing that it's again been compromised or that there's a level of, of, uh, of, uh, of this program being compromised. Ms. Caesar and Ms. Garman Mr. or Chair, somebody else. Mr. Chair, um, Senator Rosen, um, I, I will speak to your first part. Um, I will say we were not surprised. Um, the unfortunate thing is, is that we do not, our area investigates client fraud, not provider fraud. So as part of the investigation of the, the client fraud, we are often running across as they start to investigate and uncover different things, especially if it gets to the county attorney's office, that we are seeing these types of things happening. Um, and then we refer them to the, to the state to complete that investigation. So I would say that we were probably not surprised, but I can let the staff that do that more of the investigation speak to that. Somebody else want to comment about that? Mr. Yeah, Chair, Senator, um, <laughs> Investigator Gabbert from the uh, County Attorney's Office. Um, we did see a lot of empty buildings that were fronted as child care centers. And we were very, we were frustrated with not being able to do anything about that. And we were um, heartened when the OIG's office formed a task force on that. We have helped them on search, war search warrants on those um, bigger cases, and we are there helping whenever we can, just because it is something that was frustrating to us. Go ahead, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, okay, thank you. That's a little disheartening, though, <laughs> too. Um, is your uh, relationship and your interaction with law enforcement at the county level where you think it should be? Is that, does that work well as far as being able to share information? I know that there is a, a different type of relationship within the, all different counties, and it really depends on who is leading the fraud investigation and if they have that type of, of uh, relationship. I think that's critical to making sure that we get the information right, you know, and that and that it's, um, it's positive and it's going forward. And we, um, we aren't wasting resources. But that law enforcement piece is very, very critical. And can you explain a little bit about what you know, um, not only in your county, but in other counties too? Um, Mr. Chair yeah. and Senator, our investigators um, at the initial level are Anoka County Sheriff's officers. And I do know that they also work with other departments. Um, you know, within the county um, police departments. So I, I feel that our relationship with law enforcement is good. Um, I can't really speak to other counties and how they operate. So, I, and Senator Eisen, so I'll call you in a second, but you mentioned storefronts that were masquerading as child care centers and you couldn't do anything. Can you just give me like when that was and why you couldn't do anything? Mr. Chair, that was several years ago. It was before the task force was formed. And I would talk with other counties about that, um, particularly metro area counties. Um, child care centers were uh, boarded up, paper over the windows, uh, no children seen going in or out. Um, but the cases were too big for us to handle at the county level, which is why we were, again, glad that the OIG came and formed a, ta a task force on that. 
And so, so let's, that's really like head exploding kind of testimony. Um, so today you drive by and you see a place that somebody licensed as a child care center. What do you do today? And they're, and they're not seeing any kids and you have a suspicion that this is not a legit Mr. Operation. Chair, those would go to the OIG's office. And so, um, let's, okay. So they're getting, they said they had 100 kids there, and ACAP is sending them the payments to the, for the 100 kids. You go like, oh, there's no kids there. So you don't call ACAP, you call the OIG, and then they do something. Is that what happens currently? Again, Mr. Chair, we, we investigate recipient fraud. Right. A lot of our recipients are also workers at those centers, so we would be looking at it as something with the recipient fraud. But yes, those would go not to ACAP, but to the OIG's office. Um, I don't know what human services would do with their case, but in my, uh, with the county attorney's office, we would send that to the OIG's office. And let me help you understand. So. Um, this is really a good discussion. I, I didn't realize the counties only investigate recipients and not the providers. That is really interesting to me. Um, and because we think that you're watching all of them, and so apparently not. But so, um, so you would, somebody there would call up OIG, hey, we got a, got a bad looking thing up here in Coon Rapids or somewhere, and uh, we think you should know. Uh, they're getting checks, but ACAP is the funder of them, so the ACAP would keep sending $100 times whatever to them for a period of time. But once you call OIG, you're kind of done. And then you go all looking for somebody else who's being a recipient who's doing something else wrong. Is that pretty much how it goes? Mr. Chair, that is about what we do right now. I don't know if Human Services would do something else, and maybe Ms. Gorman can speak to that. If you don't mind commenting, I would appreciate it. Mr. Ms. Chair, I would say that there are some instances where the OIG might involve our investigators again. Um, I would say that's infrequent, though. All right. And then uh, just one more second. And so um, in terms of re so we're kind of coming in for a landing here, but this is very productive and the kind of discussions we have to have to get our arms around this. And so um, you're investigating recipients and most of the economic assistance, child care ones. Uh, do you have any indication that there's fraud on the part of recipients of PCA or waiver services that you've noticed over your time? Ms. Gorman or whoever. Uh, Mr. Chair, we, there is a level of PCA fraud and, and it's very similar to the child care assistance fraud when we find it or suspect it, we do turn that over to the OIG's office. All right, even if it's a recipient level, if, if the recipient's lying about something. No, we can. We would investigate. Oh, so if it's a provider level, you don't, you pass it on. If you think the recipient is somehow not, has overrepresented their need or something, or they're lying about something, you would investigate that. Mr. Chair, yes. may I answer that, please? Um, we had a case just recently, and it was one of our $200,000 cases, uh, where the provider of the PCA services was not in the area doing the PCA work, um, and we investigated that, and were successfully, uh, we successfully prosecuted that case. All right. Uh, Senator Isaacson. Um, thank you. Uh, I was uh, surprised to hear the question were you astonished by the $100 million in fraud that was leaving MSP when it is my understanding that uh, none of that's actually been proven to be coming out of CPAP, CCAP? And so I'm a little concerned with the phrasing of the question as I would uh, perhaps dispute or maybe talk about that while I am definitely pleased that we're addressing and finding ways and having cases open to make sure that we're accounting for every dollar that's, that's being spent, I would caution not to characterize that as a $100 million problem as we're not actually sure where the $100 million came from, nor is there any direct linkage between the two. It's a claim someone made in a news article, but the facts don't bear that out. And so I want to be clear that we need to be careful when we're talking about this because you're really casting wide dispersions onto some pretty good people trying to do good work. Uh, that being said, clearly if we have people that are abusing the system, we have to be careful with that. And I, I appreciate the work you guys are doing to manage that, but I, I just have to make that comment. Thank you. Uh, appreciate the comment. Um, other questions? Uh, 
randomly, yeah, Senator Rosen. Oh, no, thank you. Question thank or you. a comment. And thank you, Senator, for your comments. Um, it was, um, uh, I, I appreciate that, that feedback. It was on the $100 million CCAP fraud investigation. I uh, was wondering, Mr. Chair, if we have had a overview from the OIG task force and what the, the results they have found so far, uh, if they can say anything, because they, they have been, how long have they been uh, working on this? Well, they're coming next, so you can ask them that. Oh, thank you. And um, Ms. Caesar, is there any way that you can, I really appreciate you being here and talking about this. Um, is there a, like a short list that you can give us of things that we can do to help assist you Ms. better Caesar. and to provide the services that you need? Uh, Ms. in the county, but to make sure that we pull this in, this fraud in. Yeah. Ms. Caesar. Um, Mr. Chair, Senator Rosen, I really appreciate you asking that. Um, I think that we can come up with a list. One of them is um, exactly what we had talked about relating to self-employment. Um, I think that's a big one. And um, those investigations a lot of times are attached to big dollars um, and take a lot of time to kind of sort through those cases, and so I think that suggestion would most likely rise to the top, but there are probably some other suggestions that we could make, so thank you. Okay, well, I think that's, uh, this has been a very good discussion, and I think that the other counties should be proud to have proxies as good as in Oak County, and, uh, but I've, as working with the counties, I'm pretty convinced that across the state, they're all as dedicated as you, uh, interested in serving and doing the right thing. And so uh, I'll repeat my call that as different counties and Anoka will be talking to them directly, of course, have ideas about how to strengthen their hand in making sure that the right things happen in a good way and the wrong things don't happen, uh, or how we can facilitate that. We are all ears. So thank you very much. Thank you. And this uh, sometimes, yeah, come on down, Ms. Ham and uh, Mr. Evans. Uh, you can come together. We, um, you never know how when you plan a hearing, if it's the right order. I think this was a pretty good order. I agree. Um, and so uh, some days it works. Anyway, so you have some prepared thoughts you've come to tell us, I suppose. Uh, we're going to, either way, we're stopping at 2.55. So uh, that's, uh, I think, a good amount of time. And uh, I think this is a very productive discussion. And so, Ms. Ham, I guess I'll call on you first, or unless Mr. Evans wanted to go first. Okay. So welcome. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Carolyn Hamm. I am the Inspector General for DHS. And I want to thank you for having us here to talk about the important work that the OIG is doing in conjunction with the counties and various law enforcement agencies, including the BCA. Um, just to take us back for just a moment, I want to, when we think about in 2011, uh, in line with Governor Dayton's commitment towards cultivating a more transparent state government that works for all Minnesotans, DHS revamped its fraud prevention and recovery efforts and organized them into a single office based on the Federal Inspector General model, thus the OIG. Uh, this reorganization has allowed us to increase our focus on fraud prevention and recovery, streamline our external program integrity operations, and more effectively structure staff who investigate, audit, and evaluate others. Between 2012 and 2013, the OIG has recovered more than $100 million of state and federal dollars. And so that a bit goes to your question, Senator Kiffmeyer. Typically, with many of the benefits that we offer to Minnesotans, there is often a federal share. And so anytime there's a federal share, if we recover money, then we're going to also pay back the federal share. So, uh, so I... I really am here to answer more of your questions than to give a formal presentation, but as you know, we have recently uh, increased our staff in both our SERS area, which is our Medicaid fraud area, as well as the CCAP uh, provider fraud. Um, so our CCAP unit is currently at eight investigators, one supervisor, one data analyst, and one attorney to assist with administrative cases. Plus, we have the two BCA agents that are directly officed with us and work very closely with us. And uh, so I wanted to just start with how, when the transition goes from OIG to BCA leading it. So our uh, 
investigators will be looking at tips, looking at data, determining if they think they have a case at a point where they feel that they, we may have enough to warrant opening a criminal case, it is at that point that the BCA would take over. So I'll let Superintendent Evans talk just a little bit about that process. Maybe before we get to that, that's gonna, I'm interested and eager about that, but just to finish up with the last discussion we had. So um, some of my crack county staff uh, driving past a storefront and discovered the child care center that got licensed uh, last year now has paper on the front and no children seem to be coming and going. Um, and they just noticed this. And so they're getting payments for some number of kids a week from my county child care group, ACAP. And the money's flowing and they give you a call and they say, hey, look what we found. Can you tell me what happens next and the timeline? Uh, it, generally, yes, I can tell you generally. So yeah. our tips come in, we prioritize them uh, depending on amounts of money. We do tend to focus on the highest, the uh, providers who are getting the most money, which I don't think is unusual. Uh, but once we decide to investigate, we will, I'm not gonna tell you how we determine if there's potential fraud, because again, I don't want to uh, give away any secrets. Uh, but we would look at it. And if we come to a conclusion, yet, yes, we think there is fraud, we have two options. And again, I'm gonna throw it over to, to Superintendent Evans in just a moment. But we can either notify the counties that we think there is fraud and ask them to discontinue all payments. And we can do that. But we don't always do that because of the criminal investigation that may be going on. And so um, I would like Superintendent Evans to explain why we might not cut the money off right at the moment where we feel like we have enough evidence in a civil case. Mr. Evans, welcome to the committee. And so I appreciate you coming and if you have some prepared thoughts or you, you've heard the discussion and so we're interested. This is not the Judiciary Committee so we don't hear a lot from you all. So it's, a lot of this is news to us. When, uh, but welcome to the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Drew Evans. I'm the superintendent at the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension. And I think as the chair opened uh, the hearing, all fraud is bad. And so we do have a number of programs that we work on um, at the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension in terms of fraud investigations in a variety of contexts. And this is one of those areas that we have a partnership with the Department of Human Services that we entered into because uh, I think we all agree that um, any of our citizens in this state being defrauded of either their taxpayer dollars or them being defrauded individually is something that we should all look into. And so DHS originally uh, approached us uh, as a state criminal investigative agency when they uh, formed the OIG and they were looking at ways to provide greater um, investigation and prosecution of people that are defrauding our system. And so we've been doing that with them now for a number of years. And really what our agents are doing, there's two agents, um, as was noted, and they are directly embedded with the OIG, that's where they're housed, and they work very closely with the unit that's examining the payments, the tips that are coming in, and when they see a case that may be able to be proven beyond a reasonable doubt, I know it was brought up the standard before, and that is the standard that we need to look at for ours, that we begin that investigation, and we may or may not know that on the front end of these cases. What I will tell you is that with these provider fraud cases, they are fairly time intensive and I think I'll get to the question that was kind of asked, what happens in these investigations? There really is a process that we're needing to go through to show beyond a reasonable doubt that those overpayments did in fact occur and that they were defrauding um, the Department of Human Services state of Minnesota in that process. And so we do that through a variety of investigative techniques that we would employ in any uh, fraud or criminal investigation that we may conduct. But because of that, we need to show all those individuals um, overages in that process and so it does take us a significant amount of time to do that. The reason that we may not um asked to have the, um, the money turned off immediately is that the ultimate goal in any one of these cases is A, to turn off the spigot of state funds that are going to somewhere you know fraudulently, but at the same time, we want a conviction on that individual so that they'll never be allowed to defraud the state of Minnesota again in that process. And so we may need a period of time where those payments continue to go out while we work through that investigative process to bring prosecution, but rest assured we will always go 
in trying to seize any assets that that fraudulent business has uh, currently. And then through the court process, obviously restitution will be requested for the state of Minnesota in that process. And again, I'm happy to answer any questions the committee may have about our work um, uh, in that process. As I said, we have two agents that are assigned, but our, our, our kind of deal with DHS is some of these are very large scale investigations that when we're taking them down, that it involves multiple agents, multiple assets of the BCA that we um, utilize with those two agents. So it's often above and beyond the two agents that are assigned because we want to make sure that these cases are done properly, that we get the right results at the end of the day. Thank and you. I think I would just like, excuse oh, me, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would just like to add that in addition to working very closely with the BCA, we are always working with our federal partners as well. So anytime we open a child care uh, assistance fraud case, we work with DHHS OIG and they open a case at the same time. And so we work very closely with them. We work with Homeland Security, the IRS, the FBI. Uh, so we are always working along with the BCA with all of these agencies to see if we can get the broadest uh, investigation and the broadest relief that we can. Questions from members? Really? Senator Isis? Well, then I'll talk to you. Oh, yeah, Senator <laughs> Kiffmeyer. Yeah, but thank you. I have Mr. lots of questions, so go <laughs> ahead. <laughs> people at Chambers can chance at it here. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you. So when you do your investigations as well and recovery of funds is there, so as uh, you mentioned, so there, the funds go back proportionately to where they came from. Is that correct? Ms. Sam. Uh, Mr. Chair, Matt, uh, Senator Kif Kifmeyer, that's correct. Okay. Senator Kifmeyer. Yeah, that's pretty much um, the main thing. The, question, the other question I have is, um, are, are there legislative changes that could be made that would be helpful to you in this process? Ms. Sam. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Kefmeyer, uh, we think there are. We've been doing a lot of thinking, um, given all the uh, understanding how serious this problem is. We have a lot of thoughts. I mentioned some at the end of last session. Uh, we're still looking at those. We haven't finalized any proposals, but some of the things that we had talked about were uh, perhaps requiring a surety bond if you get a certain amount of CCAP that you'd have to have a surety bond, lowering the burden of proof in our administrative hearings uh, for disqualifications from clear and convincing to preponderance of the evidence, um, doing some help in just making it easier to establish if a child is absent or not because it was just complicated, um, and also increase the penalties for a disqualification so that it isn't just one, uh, yeah, so that you're not just you get one intentional violation and you're out for a year, we want to increase that. We want to make it more drastic. So that's, that's just a few. We, we are thinking of other options as well uh, because this is a very serious problem and we know that um, and we are absolutely committed to figuring out, uh, in addition to increased staff, which is what we needed, um, what other steps we need to take in order to get this problem uh, minimized at least. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And so a uh, question to that as well is, are there ways or methods that could be employed uh, to prevent this happening to begin with? I mean, we're expending a lot of resources after the fact. Are there things up front in the process of qualifying for this? Um, I, the surety bond is one thing, but that, again, that's a proof and a recovery. Or maybe it's a deterrent to fraud if they have to put up a surety bond. So, but are there some things that could be done to make sure that those who truly want to do this good work are able to do so, those who wish to only use it as an excuse for fraud and theft, how to distinguish and can you do that up front in the process of qualifying? Ms. Ham. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Kiffmeyer. I think that the surety bond has more than just the effect of being able to recover. I think that is a barrier that uh, you know you have you would have to be able to show that you're financially viable, et cetera, to the surety bond company. So I do see it as a as a screen as well as after the fact. Um, we are open to other ideas uh, in terms of the qualifications, but of course we don't. We wouldn't license somebody that didn't appear to be licensed and ready, excuse me, didn't appear to be competent and ready to run a child care center. 
we wouldn't issue even, even issue the license, so they wouldn't be able to get CCAP. So obviously they're doing enough to meet that standard, and so that is the difficult issue is, well, how do you determine that? Well, it's, good, Mr. Chair. it's good, Mr. Chair, to kind of understand how that surety bond works, because then the bond company does some of this upfront work that we're talking about. And so I, I appreciate that explanation. That's very helpful. And, and just to tip our hand, I, that there seems like there's some merit in that surety bond thing. And so I'm sure some people in the audience disagree with that. So this is a good time to engage in sideways discussions with me and others about how that may be a good or a bad thing. Uh, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just can't help but wonder how we got to this point. Where did we get where um, the qualifications started to slip or broaden to the point where there was this ability to abuse this program? And whether the allegations of $100 million are correct or not, still, there's a lot you could do with $100 million for people that truly uh, deserve to have the assistance. And um, I know it's maybe an exercise and that's not necessary, but I, I am surprised how we have gotten to this point and what we need to do to tighten this up for the betterment of everybody. Nobody wants to see fraud. So it's just a little of my rant and rave, uh, um, and I'm, I'm frustrated because um, did we create the loopholes? Apparently we did, somewhere along the line, and we need to tighten this up. Mr. Evans. You want to comment on that? You looked like you were interested. Nope. In, oh, you're like just hoping it stops pretty soon. Okay, Miss Ham, did you want to comment at all about that, or is that that's kind of rhetorical, I guess? Um, I agree. <laughs> Senator Ralph. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I just I want to express a concern uh, here that we have a daycare shortage crisis in Minnesota, uh, and while I'm very concerned that we track down the, the, the bad actors, and, and, and I applaud the steps that are being taken and hope that we can provide, uh, continue to provide additional tools, especially at the county level. Um, the dual licensure examination system to me seems to be something that we should be looking at to try and help facilitate people coming into the system and also to, 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 to help them improve their own uh, operations as we go forward. And I've discussed with several county administrators and their human services administrators about ways we can look at this and try and both bring some uniformity, but also try and, and, and deal with this dichotomy where the, the counties deal with the home-based and smaller operations and then the state deals with the larger operations. But I, I go back to my my concern, and that is, is that we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, pardon the pun. Uh, but we do have to, I think, look carefully at the way we approach licensure and, and examination. Uh, the surety bond idea was one which has been floated since I've been here, which is a couple of years. I'm new in this game, but uh, that sounds like something that's good if it's applied properly. But I don't want to create a barrier to someone coming into the business who is a legitimate uh, provider of those services. So I think as we go forward, we have to move with great caution uh, in doing this. Uh, so that's kind of the, the thoughts that I have. Um, did you want to comment on that or just go ahead, Ms. Ham? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Ralph, uh, I, we are very much aware of the child care shortage. Um, the shortage tends to be in the family child care area, and that is not where we're seeing the fraud. So fortunately, at least in that respect, I think we can tighten some of the controls around uh, CCAP without impacting the family child care. And that's specifically why we put the limit in the surety bond, so that if, you, if you're not getting more than 250000 if you're getting less than $250,000 in CCAP, this requirement wouldn't apply. Because that's not where we're seeing the problem. We're seeing the problem in large centers uh, that get a lot of CCAP money. So we are very cognizant of that issue and uh, are trying to delicately parse that. Uh, speaking of indelicate, um, <laughs> so just I read, a, I read the paper and uh, there was a case that made the headlines, uh, Mr. Clement apparently. Um, and I realize it's in litigation and all that, but um, since there's charges and they're unsealed and it's sort of public, can you just, could, 
Is it possible to get a timeline about just kind of when he was discovered and when you pressed a charge? Is that something you can tell me about or tell me what you can um, between the two of you? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, members of the committee, what I can tell you is that um, the main conduct that is uh, alleged in the complaint is from 2012 to 2015. So that gives you, again, the sense of how complicated these cases can be and how long they can take to prosecute. Um, and I can tell you just, again, with regard to this question of a when do we stop the payments, so when we are looking at Medicaid uh, fraud, that is our SERS unit that's going to be investigating that. And we are required by law, by federal law, to stop any payments once we have a credible allegation of fraud. Except if the law enforcement, if there's a criminal investigation ongoing and, our, and the law enforcement agency requests that we not do that. So it's exactly like with the CCAP situation. And again, there can be good reasons to do that. Once we get the word from the, criminal, uh, the law enforcement, and in that case it would be the Attorney General's office. That's the structure of how it works. Once the Attorney General's office tells us that uh, it's okay to stop the payment, we stop it. We stop it immediately. If they tell us they're not going to prosecute it, we stop it immediately and we pursue it administrative remedies if that's appropriate. Um, so that's about all I can tell you in this specific case um, is that, you know, it was, it was uh, many, many years ago, which of course just speaks to the difficulty of how these cases, how long these cases can take, especially because they're just very document intensive. And Mr. Evans, you're not leaning forward at all to answer this question, I know is that, so maybe that's the only, <laughs> do you, do you want to offer any thought about it or? Oh, Are Mr. You able Chair, to? I just, I, for the committee, I can't talk to it. We didn't investigate that particular oh, okay. case. So. Hey, I'll call it plausible deniability. Anyway, <laughs> um, but I'm really interested beyond the scope of today's hearing is how did this guy get away with it for so long and who knew about it that maybe said something? Where did it go off the rails from being reported? You know, it's a three-year-old thing at the end and you've been investigating it for whatever period of time that you can't tell me. Um, but I'm looking after, as Mr. Noble said, how do we handle a day-to-day? Because -day? I am persuaded if there's 1% um, fraud in DHS, that's $150 million. If it's 10, it's a billion and a half. And that is real money. And, um, and here we have a 1.9 million recovery on a book of business between 20 and $50 million, maybe up to 10% in the economic side. No, no, for the Oka County part. If they're 50 million, it'd be 4%. If it was 20, it'd be. No, I said between 20 and 50. I Originally, I thought you said between 100 and 200 million. A billion and 9 billion. No, I, no, between. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to. But it, when you look at the eligibility issues, it's 7% a great day, you know, 17. What number is it? Um, so I'm just interested. You can't go back and change things, but on behalf of the people needing it. That, that's, and we'll just. And if, Ms. Ham, as you ruminate on the case and genericize it to the point that you can help us empower Dakota County to find that guy sooner or my county or whatever counties. Um, and I just have one more thought I want to float and uh, if people have questions, they'll still do it. I think we're kind of coming in for a landing here. So the thought about Anoka County or the counties looking after the recipients, you looking after their providers is an interesting division of labor and I'm not sure if it's the correct one, but it's an interesting place you're at. Um, and you sanction providers. And so in the article, uh, there were, um, there's, so there's, if, if some innocent people get caught up in a scam where they don't know that they shouldn't take $200 a month for not taking their kid to the child care. Let's pretend they just couldn't know that. Um, if you do a two strike thing, like the first time you go like, by the way, this is a really bad thing. You do it again, we're gonna kick you out of the program for five years or something. Um, it seems like that would dry up the population of people willing to participate in some of these fraudulent ideas. And so um, I've, I'm not going to ask you to answer that question now, but would you, would people think about that? And so we are happy to share services of people who need them and who are doing the right thing. We are, at least for my district and my county, we're not interested in giving things to people who are doing the wrong thing. And so, uh, and so that's just a thought, and I, 
floated here only as a thought, and people can write me emails and say it's a great idea or you're a horrible person. But I, if we don't get our arms around some of the pipeline of people willing to engage in a fraudulent thing, never mind the provider, um, uh, then that's an issue too. So um, do you want to react or you just want to like uh, yes, Mr. lean Chair, back I do. like Mr. Evans? And uh, so, so one thing I would like to point out that is different uh, than when this conduct occurred where what you had was a person who had already been convicted of Medicaid fraud, so had had been, I think, even gone to jail, and then was, of course, excluded from operating in Medicaid, but then was able to open up several different uh, PCA agencies under other people's names, because, of course, that's what you do. But what I can tell you is that since that time, we have tightened up at least that initial uh, enrollment looking at providers. So we have... Um, identified who are high-risk providers. PCA agencies are one, DME companies are another, transportation companies are another. If they want to come into the Medicaid program, so they're new, they want to come in, we have a lot more requirements than we did back, back at that time. They have to have a fingerprint-based uh, background study, not only the owner, all the managers, and of course anyone that's directly providing care. We uh, check all their information against the Secretary of State's office to make sure that if they say they're the owner, does it say that they're the owner in the Secretary of State's office? Um, we check all of the exclusion lists, whether they're the state, the federal, there's a terminated provider list uh, that CMS runs, we put that together. They have to take training to make sure that they understand what all their requirements are. We've added a lot of attestations, which the reason that's important is so when they sign up, they have to say, yes, I understand this, I understand this, I understand this, and that can be helpful in the prosecution when they come back and want to say, oh, I had no idea I had to do this, the, that goes to the intent. So we do that. Uh, PCA agencies, we require a surety bond. So that is one thing that we've added. The other thing, and this is within my area, is we now have our provider screening unit. And so they specifically go out and visit all new high-risk providers. So they actually physically go out to the location. They check to make sure that everything they've said on their application is correct. If there's somebody there that's telling, that's telling them, you know, oh, pretending appears to be the manager, but they're not the person on the, they're not the manager on the application, that we're gonna fail them on that visit. Um, and so I can tell you that in 2017, we made 562 visits. We failed 101 providers out of that. That doesn't necessarily mean they ultimately failed, but at least initially. And we referred 61 cases to our provider investigations unit. So this is something that is new uh, that I think helps Obviously, people can be extremely clever and hide their participation, but we're, we're putting in the steps that we think we could take that will help to catch some of this, and I think that we have. If you look at that complaint, you can see that a couple of the agencies in 2015, when they tried to enter in, we went out, we asked them for access, they wouldn't give it to us, we were able to cut them off right then. So I do think things have improved a little since that time. I'm not saying we're there, but I think you know, we've, we've definitely put some, um, some steps in place that help that. Uh, the other thing that I just wanted, you were asking a lot of questions about numbers and everything, and so I just wanted you to know that we do finally have our 2017 annual report. I apologize for the delay. But this gives you a lot of good information about, for example, the fraud prevention investigations, how much we got in grants, how many overpayments did they uh, did they identify? I can tell you that, just for example, that the, the main source of the overpayments is actually health care. So that would be people that were inappropriately eligible for health care. Um, but it goes through how many investigations, our recoveries, everything else, and it's on our website. We can get you a copy if you want, but it's on our website, and it gives you a lot of good information, at least for 2017. And I think maybe you could send that link to Larissa, and she can sure. get it out to the community. Be happy to do that. Senator Isaacson. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for you. Um, when you think of um, bigger versus smaller providers in the PCA world, where do you find, is there a preponderance of fraud that occurs in one versus the other? And I realize it's kind of vague because what defines is bigger or smaller, but is there a, a trend that leads us in any direction on that when it comes to providers, if there is a fraud issue? Ms. Ham. Um. 
I, I, I don't, I don't think, excuse me, uh, Senator right. Isaacson, Senator Abraham. come down and talk. I, I, I'm not certain that I know if there's a, I mean, certainly there's the, the small, you know, somebody says they're working and they're actually working at a, at a Walmart. Um, mm -hmm. But we tend to try to focus more on ones where we think it's throughout the agency. By the, Senator Isaac. By the nature of what you're doing, it ends up that you'd be focusing on larger ones just because that's where the most get is, so to speak, right? Is that fair? Oh, go ahead. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chair. Senator Isaacson, that's right. All right, thank you. I wish that it would work like this in my real life when people <laughs> they try to call on. <laughs> Senator Rosen. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. Inspector General, you mentioned that you put eight new um, uh, staff onto the CCAP issue um, and working with two BCA agents. I didn't catch the time frame on that. When did all this expansion come about? Is, was it um, just this year, or have you been working on that? Missed those numbers. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Senator Rosen. Uh, so first of all, that actually is our total. That's not how many new oh. we added. Um, but we we started in 2014 is when we first got our peop a, a few people. We had four. I think that was including the BCA agents. Um, and so in 2017, you appropriated the money that uh, allowed us to add the additional people. And so it, uh, you know, we've been working with the increased staff in the last year, and um, it's helping a lot. And so, uh, Ms. Ham, just to that point, I, you heard the Noka County's testimony that they, uh, they put in a dollar worth of work, including as part of your grant, and they get back $5.98. Statewide average is $4.42. When we did your appropriation, I remember it specifically, it only made money because you had FFP on the administrative side. Um, I thought that was curious at that point that there would be no recovery expected from putting on more people. And, and I think that as you factor these people in more, it'd be interesting to see what the recovery really is from adding those individuals. And further, as we go forward, if we would increase the size of the grants to the counties, what we, it seems like at least $2, it should be two to one at the worst, it seems like, if they match it. Um, but so, do you have any thoughts about that? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So a couple of, you have sort of two different issues there. One is the, the FPI, and we absolutely agree it's a very much of a, a very good investment of our state dollars. Um, what I want to just clarify is that it's typically uh, th those ratios have to do with not only overpayments but also savings. Um, so it's, uh, Onoka County does a fabulous job, and but I will say that Overall, the total overpayments we identified last year with the FPI was only 7.8 million, and we spent 35. So it's not directly money coming back. It can be the fact that now that person is no longer on medical assistance, CCAP, et cetera, and so we count those savings to come to the, the four to, three to one, four to one ratios. But it's absolutely, we think it's a very good investment, and we are looking at, uh, you know, where do other, what, what additionally do counties need? Are there more, uh, could they use more resources? Um, and then with regard to the CCAP, the, the, the difficulty with the recoveries on that side is that um, the money, yes, we have recovered some money, and I can tell you the numbers that we have um, on our civil cases, so these would be the ones where we say it's an overpayment, but we don't charge the uh, BCA, or no one charges them. We've recovered 252,000. Um, in the restitution, so that would be in the criminal cases, we've recovered 171,000. You can see that that's not very much compared to the amount of money that we know has gone out the door inappropriately. Uh, so, and that largely is because the money is gone long before we get to it. Um, so I think it's hard for us to say that uh, we know that there's a waiting list, and so if we if we get uh, you know if, if we stop one provider from uh, providing child care, it's likely that those dollars will be spent by some other child care, um, and so that I think is traditionally why we haven't shown savings when we uh, add the additional people to the CCAP fraud area. Thank you, Senator Isaacson. I just I just want to make sure I heard that correctly. Did you just say that? because you add the money that you're no longer giving to the person that was defrauding the system, that goes into the way you calculate the return on the investment? Ms. Did I, I hear that correctly? Ms. Sam. Uh, Senator Abler, Senator Isaacson. I was talking specifically about the FPI, which is the county program. Yep, yep. 
And what, yes, what I was saying is that it includes overpayments, so actual money coming in, but it also includes savings. So people, uh, you know, if, if we had somebody that was on getting four different kinds of assistance and they no longer, they've been disqualified, then we count that as a savings. And that's how we get to the, the revenue of spending $1 saving four, four right. three. So how long do you count that savings, hypothetically? Like, do you save for the end of the month, end of the year? I, how do you do come to that conclusion? Ms. Hamm. Uh, Senator Abler, Senator Isaacson, that is a really good question, and it's one that we, we are quite conservative. Um, I believe we take three months. Um, some right. other places might take six months. Some might take as much as a year. Uh, but I believe we take three months. Senator Isaacson. And if you don't include that, what does it look like? Ms. Ham. Well, I think according to well, our numbers so. from 2017, we spent $35 million, uh -huh. and we, were, we identified overpayments of $7.4 All right. So That's, it yeah. would have cost money if you and don't I, I, include that. Don't, don't take, Mr. Chair. Ms. Senator don't take my so. comments to mean that I don't think you're spending your money wisely, but I think that those are two vastly different representations of the same pieces of information that have a much different effect if people hear it, right? And that'd be, that'd be my concern about that, just making sure that we have a clear understanding of that. So when we throw on numbers like four to one, five to one, I oftentimes use that example in higher education because it's 13 to one, uh, but that actually is real dollars coming back in for sure. <laughs> you're talking about dollars that we're not spending that we might have spent mistakenly. I think that's an important distinction. Thank you. Way to stand message with the education 13. That's, that's very good. <laughs> and uh, I'll ask uh, that my county next when I talked to them about how that 1.9 million factors into that calculation. I'm interested in that. So yeah. Yeah, coming in for, go ahead, Ms. Hamm. Uh, uh, Senator Abler, I, I would just like to mention, so you saw in, in Anoka County, they actually do, based on their numbers, they, I, I'm assuming the 1.9 is collected, uh, that they actually do more, we collect uh, real money just, up there. We don't collect. Yes, this. there you go. 13 to 1, whatever, <laughs> conjuring. And I just, uh, we're kind of coming in for a landing. I do have a question for one of your staff, Ms. Ham. If Mr. Orr would come down, if you would mind. Um, and this will be maybe my last question. Uh, other members, just have a chair if you'd like. So, oh, welcome to the committee. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I have a question. Can you tell me the difference between the Director of Legislative and External Affairs <laughs> for, the, for the DHS wide operations and the Portfolio Operations Associate Director <laughs> for Advanced Research and Analytics Organization? Can you tell me what those two jobs might be? Just a different uh, group of cats to her, <laughs> Mr. Chair. Uh, sorry, my name is Christopher Orr. I'm the Legislative Director for Operations for the Department of Human Services. Thank you. I just wanted We're to call you. three more days. For three yeah, days. I just, uh, well, I just wanted, uh, you've been stellar, and uh, DHS will be the poorer for your absence, and uh, hopefully United Healthcare will benefit uh, our great citizens with your presence there, but I wanted to thank you for your service. Thank you so much. Thank you. So uh, I think we're gonna, yeah, thanks for being a good sport. Ms. Hamm, Mr. Evers, Mr. Evans, and uh, Noka County and um, all the rest, um, thank you for your, attendance, your attention to this. Um, we'll probably be meeting middle of October, watch for the announcement. Um, and I think I'll float something then and I want all your advice about all that. So with that, uh, happy autumn. Thank Return. you, Mr. Chair.